Thank you very much, Brian. It's kind of nice to see a crowd like this in the, in the town. I appreciate this. Um, and please, after this presentation, if there's questions or concerns or any yes, any just in the off the wall questions about what we're doing, um, nothing's wrong. What I want to talk to you about tonight about is where does this where does this technology fit into the science and science and industry in this, this state? Um, Alaska is very unique in that regard. That there's a lot of um, applications for a manned aircraft, and the majority, actually, of the nation recognizes some of the benefits of the technology in Alaska, where you have remote areas, very large expanses of area, very, um, and not a lot of natural resources to deal with. Just some operations that have happened up here um, in the last few years that some may know of and some may not. In 2003 and 2004, the Coast Guard came up and they were interested in, in using unmanned aircraft for um, maritime domain awareness. They wanted to understand fishing activities in the Bering Sea and um, yeah, out, out towards the maritime boundary line between the US and Russia. Um, likewise, this, this aircraft, this is actually taxiing out at the King Salmon Airport um, in southwest Alaska. That air, an airplane, you'll see a little later, it has about an 80-foot wingspan. So when we're setting out at the runways out there, they actually stored that aircraft inside the hangars that they would, the Air Force would normally put their um, intercept fighters in, and the airplane had to go in the hangar diagonally because the wingspan was so large. We also have a lot of, uh, recently, a lot more small, small aircraft activity. Here's just a couple operations with this plane um, that we'll learn about here. To give you a little background on this technology, now this, this whole technology has been driven historically by the military, um, US and foreign. Um, and we're trying to find at the university the civil and the industrial applications for it. So we're really not into developing the technology, if you will, but we're trying to figure out how to best use it for this new, new opportunities. In the early days, you know, there's even some arguments that there were some unmanned airplanes in World War I. But clearly, I think no one would disagree that it, the, v, the V-1 rocket that the Germans built was essentially an unmanned airplane. It was a missile that flew itself as an aero-breathing missile here in this corner. And in the history, as it goes down, there's been lots of developments during the Vietnam era. And, and, but as the um, electronics industry started really maturing, um, for the, in the transistors, they moved in, in the 90, 1991, this aircraft is a pioneer. It's about a 15 foot wing span. They launched these off of battleships out of the Persian Gulf. And um, unfortunately for the Iraqi soldiers, they learned that if this plane came overhead, you better get out of its way because it was basically do, doing um, artillery spotting for the, gunner, for the guns on the ship. And so actually this was some of the first history, historically recorded um, soldiers surrendering to a robot. They would come out of their bunkers and they would surrender to the plane to avoid getting hit. Um, at this time frame, unmanned aircraft in the military had kind of a, a little bit of a dogma to it. You know, there was the pilot wanted, it should be a pilot, it's my job, and where does, what's the role of these unmanned aircraft? And there was a kind of a good squabble going on through that era. Um, as the, the Department of Defense was looking at the doctrine as to who, how do you operate these planes? What should they be doing? What should humans be doing? What should robots be doing in battle? And people started looking at these things and seeing some civil applications for it. Everything from cell phone towers that are relocatable, for example, during like a natural disaster. Um, we were called in to do, some, to do some studies after Hurricane Andrew came through southern Florida um, and wiped out all the cell phone towers and all the emergency response vehicles were relied on cell coverage to communicate. So all of a sudden they had issues. They were flying manned aircraft with cell phone repeaters and they were debating could they put unmanned aircraft up for that. The war in Bosnia was probably about the first time that the technology, I would say, started to be seen in the national spectrum, national news. You started seeing the Predator unmanned aircraft flying missions in Bosnia. Um, and then that's about the time the FAA began to recognize that, you know, there's a set of technology out here we better get an understanding of and understand what it is and how it could potentially pose a threat to the aviation safety of the rest of the world. Now today, the technology has just completely exploded um, in the last 10 years. There's been over two orders of magnitude growth in the industry, in the development of new technology, in the fielding of the technology. It's gone from the point back, and you know, I said in the desert storm, you know, 
so DOD wondering what the role of this equipment is to a point now where it's, it's revolutionized their doctrines to the point that essentially almost every convoy that would be deployed today will have an aircraft, an unmanned aircraft overhead to give some guidance to the convoy commander to understand what's going on around them. Um, there's, there's just routinely taking the, the majority of the information collected from the air now in, in combat zones is actually done unmanned at all different sizes. In fact, to give you a feel for the sizes, this aircraft is a, um, a Global Hawk. Um, it's about the wingspan of about a 737. This aircraft, if you look close, there's a missile hanging underneath this one. So it actually is not just a reconnaissance aircraft, it's actually a multi-mission. It could fire upon ground targets. This is soldiers launching a hand launch. So he's basically, think of a little electric powered glider that he can launch, it's essentially a glider wing with electric power, good for about five to 10 miles, but situational awareness around their operation. This is designed as a trash can. Think of this as about the size of a trash can in an office. And its mission is actually to launch and to go out and set on rooftops and be a long-term sentry on a rooftop, be able to fly it, put it in that hostile roof and set there on the ground and operate for, for half, an hour, half an hour to half a day and go off somewhere else. Um, this aircraft is operated, the, the, the um, Striker Brigade at Fort Wainwright have some of these shadow aircraft. There was a, a, a boy asked me at the start of the presentation, or we were talking about the aircraft, if anybody talked about putting solar panels on the airplanes. This NASA unmanned aircraft actually is solar powered. So here's the King Salmon, at the King Salmon Airport in 19, or 2003, this Predator aircraft was Taxiing, taking off, and doing the operations out of there. Um, again, it was a Navy airplane, but it was in support of a Coast Guard mission. Um, give you a picture of the runway. This Coast Guard C-130, the size of the plane. It's about the size of a small general aviation aircraft. Um, this was in November. Not a lot of fishing going on in the Bering Sea, in Bristol Bay in, in November. But it was a good operations logistics exercise for them to figure out what it took to operate up here. The main reason they did that then was in 2004, they brought back the predecessor of this aircraft um, to fly the, mar the, the intent was to fly the maritime boundary line. We wound up flying over wildfires in the interior of Alaska that July. This aircraft, if you notice the ground station cockpit, looks like, essentially like, a, like the console cockpits of, of a manned airplane, two seats. This, air, this one is US Border Patrol. So it's not just a military application in that case, it's actually a Southwest Border Patrol. This obviously is a military variant of the same plane. It's got weapon stores hanging underneath the wings. Again, it's about an 80 foot wingspan, turbofan engine. They can be small, very custom applications. This airplane gets shot out of a tube and configures itself and becomes a, a decoy off of a Navy ship. Um, the Navy has experimented with several different configurations in small size, looking at different unique missions, um, different aerodynamics for different missions. There's one here at the end I'll show that they don't have to be fixed wing even. Um, this is sort of a helicopter. It's a 10 foot diameter rotor with a 12 inch diameter fuselage. It flies on a tether. This tether is, is both power as well as communications and control and it was designed to fly behind the ship in, in hostile, near hostile threats that they, it would be a decoy to, to mask the ship's radar signature. And it could fly for 100 hours at a time. Uh, they can be large. There are some intentions to, right now from NASA who has actually acquired a few of these, I think two, Global Hawks, to bring them to Alaska to do some experiments um, in the Arctic Ocean, over the Arctic Ocean. This is you know a very large aircraft, 9,000 pounds, will take off weight 32,000 pounds with fuel. Its operational ceiling is 65,000 feet, so it's, it's significantly above your commercial charter, commercial jet aircraft. Um, 42 hours of endurance. The military pilots that fly this airplane, set in California, the missions they're flying are over Afghanistan or over Iraq. Um, to get a perspective of kind of the way they communicate. This big bump on the nose, is actually a satellite tracking antenna underneath that nose to be able to keep the thing in communications all the time. Again, the wingspan is larger than 737. So these, these things vary in size from you know, just a few inches in wingspan to very large. 
and not just, this is not just the first place it looks at industrial applications. This aircraft is about, um, about a five foot rotor diameter. You've seen these shots in movies. You can't get these kind of shots on a, on a crane or on a tower. And kind of bringing this up to your mind just to, to think about the applications for this technology go way beyond the military, way beyond some of the things you may think of today. Inside, outside, sort of combination of the two. is not done fully automatic. This is, has an autopilot on board to help this pilot, um, whereas the planes will fly are fully automated in the sense that I'm not controlling the airplane. Paris? Um, at Fort Greeley, the Striker Brigade again has some of the small planes you saw in that one picture with the Pearson hand launch in it. They also have some shadows, and this is a launcher for shadows down in Fort Greeley. So we're not the only ones in Alaska that are using work these aircraft either. It's kind of a key point. So, from a background, if you will, um, and what I really wanted to impress upon you in those first few slides was that the, te the technology exists today. Um, there's really no question about that. It's how do you best use it is our challenge at the university. And just because it exists, this bottom point down here is kind of key too, just because it exists, it's new and exciting, it may not be the best answer for every question out there. You've got to try to understand what, where does this really make sense to apply. And that's our work at the university right now, is looking at figuring out what kind of operations make financial sense. Um, operations to consider. You know, perhaps it's useful for natural resources, maybe for climate change, infrastructure monitoring on remote sites. It may, at least today, in the present conditions, um, is it really, are you really ready to have these flying over and giving traffic advisories over your congested freeways? Um, are you ready to have these things fly over football stadiums, you know, where a lot of people may exist? I'm not, um, and I don't think many people are. And the last one that's kind of key is, if there already is a technology that works for that problem, this may not be the best thing to apply to it, as you have to consider this factor. I can rent a small airplane for $350 a day I, for an hour. I pay the pilot for very little time before he takes off to get my mission done. If I have to go take an aerial picture of somewhere. Um, in the unmanned aircraft, at least today, I have a lot of preparations. Before I can go do a mission, I have to plan exactly the mapping. I have to understand my environment I'm working in. There's several people that are involved. We have people operating on launching the aircraft, people that are flying the aircraft. Um, if it's a larger aircraft, I've got issues with satellite communications. Um, logistics trail for that, all those people, it's a lot more involved than the Cessna. And today, there's, it's very complicated to get permission to fly in um, the public airspace. The FAA is genuinely concerned about making sure that, that the impact of these, this technology on the, general, on the general population who would use the airspace today, be it pilots or passengers, it has no impact doesn't affect their safety, doesn't affect their convenience of their doing their job. So it's not always the right answer. It's really what I do want to impress upon some of you. Now, given that perspective, looking for the what makes financial sense, our program at the university is kind of keyed in on a, on a particular piece of hardware, this inside aircraft over here, half set up, Mainly because it, it, had a fairly, it has a fairly mature trail behind it. There's been over a thousand of these manufactured to date, this particular model. Um, very long endurance. This aircraft has an endurance of over 20 hours. Again, that opens up opportunities that you may not be able to do with a human pilot plane. Um, it's fairly small. It, two people can operate the plane, launch and recovery and entire mission. One person can fly it. The, ground, the system is very portable. The ground station literally is just this half this four foot tall rack of computers and those monitors. Proven. 
This is some operations off of a Navy ship, or sorry, a NOAA ship last October. Launches off of a rail, so it only required about 14 feet of deck space to be able to get the airplane in the air. There's a rope hanging off this, this crane, and the airplane is coming in right there. And it's caught on the rope and fished off the rope by hand. So I can launch and recover this off of a small boat. A unique feature, I can get into environments that you can't get in other aircraft. Man, aircraft in this area. Um, we were preparing for these, these operations, we were, were preparing for an experiment in the, in the Bering Sea to, um, I'll describe a little later, to look at ice seals with NOAA. So one of the reasons we picked this plant university was so that it did not require a runway. So I don't have to, I'm not restricted to where I can get to a road or a highway or a runway to actually do my operation. Finally sorted out some of our issues and made a much more gentle landing at the number three after the first two. Show you some imagery from the plane itself. This is about a mile away of thermal camera looking at the plane, the heat signature of the ship. Um, then we switched in. This is actually a video feed from the, air, from the aircraft itself. We're oh, slightly over a mile away from the ship at this point, about a thousand foot above the ship. People on this deck, you couldn't see that plane. We were looking at the antenna, pointed at the plane to see where to look to see if we could see the plane. We could not hear it or see it unless you even had an idea of where to look. And yet I could watch what was going on on board the ship deck. That was something particularly the Coast Guard was interested in for illegal fishing activities. Just because a boat's in water doesn't mean they're fishing illegally in that water. They need to understand what's really going on. And here at the end of this little video clip, there's a little segment here where we had the camera, the nose camera in the aircraft pointed forward on recovery. So you can get a feel for what it would be, what's like to hit that rope on landing. Now notice this ship has no flight deck. This ship can't launch helicopters. Um, so historically, this, this size research ship would never in the past have had the ability to have aircraft operations in conjunction with their shipborne operations. And this plane offers maybe an opportunity for that. Um, and again, looking for those niches where this unmanned technology really makes sense. Zoom back out. Now, as a pilot, I'm not really flying the airplane at this time. My computers are flying this plane. I'm watching what's happening. If I don't like it, I can stop it. But I'm not at the controls, if you will. So some experiments that we've been looking at, and I'll describe some of these in a little more detail. Alaska Fire Service. Um, we're trying to experiment with the fire service to understand the role the small technology unmanned aircraft could play in helping them deal with wildfire management in Alaska. Um, everything from, you know, imagery of what's, where the, where's the fire at now, what's going on, to maybe just a communications relay. You know, just imagine putting your, your radio t antenna at 2,000 feet and just stick it there, and I want it there for a day. Not have to worry about trying to find a mountaintop to repeat off of or anything like that. You can put it around wherever you wanted. So there might be some uses there. NOAA is, has a task right now to look at um, use of unmanned aircraft. How would it supplement their satellite to do remote sensing of the, of the Earth? Coast Guard with the icebreakers that go north in Alaska. Um, vegetation maps, climate studies, or invasive plant studies mapping the sur surface of the Earth. Um, wildlife, fish habitat. I think what you're seeing, the things that we're kind of focusing on in the program, is our common themes are adverse weather. You know, a lot of these operations are in, over the Arctic Ocean, over the Bering Sea. Um, oceanic, get away from, again, where does it make sense? If I can fly a small Cessna airplane over there, it may not make sense to fly this. But I can't fly a small Cessna 200 miles off the coast of Alaska. It's, it's just not, it's not feasible, let alone safe. Um, ships to get me there. And new payloads. A lot of this required payloads that the military today have not been developing because their interests and their military missions and what we're looking for from the civil science world is, is different, totally different objectives. Here's a little segment of one trying to map the vegetation. This is one of our first flights we did in Alaska with this plane. Um, trying to map 
the, the, the vegetation growth over a bombing range, an impact area they want to do control burns on outside of Ioson Air Force Base. So we're basically trying, to, we were able to use their, their airspace to fly in to do some experiments with the plane, but at the same time to um, help them out by helping put, put together a, a map of the vegetation so when they do their control, plan or control burn, they have a, a better understanding of how the burn might propagate through the, through the area. One more recovery and I'll switch on. This, by the way, is a man lift. So it's a 35-foot Jimmy man lift that you could rent from down on Van Horn at Van Horn to launch on to. Um, a NOAA experiment that we were doing the ship operations last October for as part of the qualifications for this, this task. You know, the whole scuttle, um, the, you know, the, the polar bears now listed on uh, with as endangered or threatened to be endangered. And there's some serious questions about the ice seals, the seals that live on the ice edge and, and as the habitat gets challenged by climate change, are they endangered as well? And that seriously impacts not just the, the research of the animal, but also um, natural oil exploration in the Chukchi Sea and in the, in the Beaufort Sea. Um, NOAA, has, as, a, as a government body, body has a responsibility to monitor these mammals, to understand their habitat, their population densities, their, any threats to their population, just to understand them. This green area is essentially the area these seals habitat during the year. They kind of hang out on the edge of the ice, like this, pulled out and resting. This ring seal, one of the species they're looking at. To get out here and to, to map this, to, how many seals are there? You know, how do you tell that? Um, today what they do is they tag several seals and they study how much time the seals above water versus below water and then they fly helicopters over the top of the area and take pictures and based on how many seals they see in the picture, they then, just, you know, if the seals half the time underwater, then they see 10 seals, there's really 20 in that picture. You know, that's kind of where, where they're at. Getting out here and mapping this very large area is with a helicopter off an icebreaker is very expensive. The icebreaker ship is a very large ship. The helicopter operations over the water are very expensive, very risky. So the, the, cha the challenge to us is could we launch off of that small ship that, by the way, goes out and catches seals and tags them while they're out doing their job normally, catching and tagging seals, so we're not buying the ship. Could we go along and fly and take the same pictures they took off that helicopter and provide them a better, better um, coverage of the, of the area? Plus, our flight durations are significantly longer than any helicopter or any human bladder on a helicopter anyway. They'd want to be out to do the mission. So that is one that may make sense. We're supposed to go out next spring on that ship. In climate change, this is just a, a little traject a map of the ice, the, the polar ice cap, how it's been varying over the last few years. Now a challenge to any engineer, if you're given the task of I want to measure the climate at this point, let's say at this location, repeatedly, every day, I want to know what the, what the temperature is, the wind conditions are, um, how much solar radiation is being com coming in, how do you do it? If you set something on the ice, that thing you set on the ice is going to move 800 miles a year, maybe. If you go out there every day, okay, now you're getting out to this point, several hundred miles, pretty dangerous spot to get to, and dropping your instrument off just to make a few measurements. Maybe this is another mission for this aircraft, and this is actually one of the reasons they're looking to bring up very large aircraft um, up NASA. If the small plane can carry a small a little payload, a little package that we can drop on the ice, measures the, the profile, vertically monitored, measures the wind, temperature, humidity as it drops down out of, off the airplane at the same point every day, every other day, or however often you want to. That information could be clicked back to the plane, and this plane can fly long enough to make legs out to the North Pole. And we're even looking at making modifications to the plane to make it fly maybe 40 hours instead of 20 hours. Just a little extra fuel is all it's going to take. Um, if we could drop these instruments at known spots, we can now provide data to the people that are trying to understand the dynamics on the, on the ice cap, exactly how fast it's melting, what's influencing it, because we can get the same measurement at the same point as a function of season. 
So maybe there's an interesting niche, niche for these unmanned aircraft in the science world. The Coast Guard um, operate, this is the Healy, the largest icebreaker they have in their fleet today. Um, this ship, last summer, and again this summer, is scheduled again, left Barrow and was going to go out in this area in the Arctic Ocean. You can get a feel for the North Pole is probably where these lines converge. And they're mapping the ocean bottom. It's uh, by, by a treaty of the seas, essentially it's a, a United Nations decision that whoever's Natural, whoever's continental shelf extends out into the Arctic Ocean, the natural resources under that are part of that country. Um, some people may have heard of a couple years ago, the, the Russians set the Russian flag on the North Pole. They went under with a submarine and planted a flag on a pole and claimed it as their soil. Well, it's, it's kind of that effort, if that was a political visible effort, but it was that effort to understand who owns that part of the world, resources. The Coast Guard go out with the ship and again, get up here and just basically map the bottom of the ocean. Now, if this ship hits thick ice, he has to go very slow, takes a lot of, a lot of fuel to pound his way through the ice. The satellite imagery that tells him where the ice is and the thickness of the ice is very coarse. You know, the, the, the resolution is not adequate to navigate the ship by. It's adequate to know where maybe there's open water, but it's not going to tell you it's thinner over here or there's a lead up here, a crack in the ice I could navigate in. If we could fly off of the ship, and help provide that kind of guidance to the, to the, to the, to the ship navigation um, could save fuel and time for those kind of missions and actually be economically viable. Um, as well as collecting data of the ice. What is, where is the ice at? Where is the well, open water at? Help, would help satellites, maybe the data from satellites be more useful because they'd have something to, to truth test, to validate, in fact, the measurements they saw from satellites and they were confirming data from aerial images. New payloads. This picture, well, this, this is actually a, a little radar, a synthetic aperture radar that weighs about two pounds that we can put on this aircraft. Um, it's, we integrated this aircraft into our aircraft last July. This picture is these three blips are actually um, inner tubes, people f swimming, this is in Utah, swimming on a lake in the inner tube, floating around an inner tube. This is not a thermal image, this is not a Photograph. This is a radar return, so it's a so it's a radio re signal return, mapping that shoreline and those people. So now I've got the, maybe the technology. I can see through the weather, see through the clouds, to see the ice, and understand the ice conditions as we fly in the Arctic Ocean. Um, here's another payload that is being developed for the small plane. Um, this is a, essentially a police radar gun, a laser um, speed speed gun from, from the police would use converted to carry on the aircraft to measure the ice roughness. The, the roughness of the ice is, tells the researchers how old that ice is. And the age of the ice is indicative of how hard it is to break up and how hard it would be for the ships to navigate through it. Um, so this is a payload that's been built by NASA, by the University of Colorado for NASA. And we're looking to integrate it to understand, help them understand sea ice and the sea ice changes. Um, taking the pictures from the airplane, you know, the whole goal, if, if, you're a, if you own a big parcel of land, if you're supposed to manage a wildfire, it would be nice to have one map. Here's a photograph of the entire area that this fire is so threatening. Well, I don't have a single camera that's going to take one picture. I have one camera that's going to take several little pictures. And some of the work we're doing in the project is how do you seamlessly stitch all that together and anchor it to the earth so it's accurate, so you know that if I see a something on that map, it's how, how, how precisely is it really on the ground and what exactly is it. So that's some of the work. Again, we're kind of getting into the engineering applications, engineering work we're doing with the aircraft now to meet some of these civil application requirements. Here's essentially when we did the, control, the, the um, wildfire burn areas, this was a trajectory we fly, flew on. So this is just plowing the field, just back and forth at, at a fixed altitude, taking those images, but trying to make a, a detailed map of this part of the, the ground, the, the vegetation underneath us. Again, the idea of being able to put an image inside, that's where the airplane was looking at that particular moment on the ground, and then I actually, so I know if I've got that, all the areas covered as I'm taking, taking my data. So a lot of our work has been going in, into um, new payloads, 
and new ways to process the data from those payloads. You know, the airplanes, the military are interested in video feeds, color video, EO, electro-optical color camera, infrared. Um, in fact, that plane right now is an infrared camera on board. It's a thermal camera, so it's measuring the heat signature of whatever it's taking a picture of. The aperture radar, this is actually a radar return, measuring the radiation if you bounce radio waves off of something and what it looks like. The different cameras, this is a high-end high Nikon digital camera we're trying to carry on the plane just to take those very high-resolution snapshots for, for NOAA, for look at those ice seals. Um, aerosol collection payloads, looking at how would you collect samples of the air from environments maybe downstream of a, of a plume, um, something. Earlier on I showed a photograph of a volcano. Nice place maybe to fly an unmanned aircraft. You want to sample what's coming out of a volcano and you don't really want to fly it manned because you might go down. Maybe that's the place to put this unmanned plane in arm's way. All right. I'm talking about the, what I would just consider the exciting part of it, the what is the plane, what kind of payloads are we doing, but this is the key part of our program. How do these planes, how can you safely integrate them with other aviation assets so that you're not a hazard to the person either on business or on pleasure flying? One effort we're doing, in fact, even doing some tests for today, is with ground-based radar. Um, this is a, a Army radar that we are running out of poker flat today, in fact, um, trying to understand if it, use it to map air traffic around us. So if we can see, the radar can see another airplane, we can know where the plane's at and we can avoid it because we can't see it visually. Um, the FAA is actually sponsoring this effort. They want us to help us understand how does radar fit, how do you verify how the radar performs, to know that it can see everything. Okay, can it see a big plane, but can it see a small plane? How far does it see? Um, those are concerns they would have with understanding how you'd apply this to, to safely reduce the chance of hitting another plane. Um, even working in the math department at the university, found some applications for pure mathematics on this, on this project, understanding the chance of, you know, if, I, if I'm just flying out there in the, in the Bering Sea, for example, at a thousand feet off the ice in the Bering Sea, what's the chance I'll hit another airplane? Well, how many other airplanes are out there? And how big are they? And how fast do they go? Let's work the mathematics out to understand the probability of that. Is it really a hazard? for me to be operating out there or not, and try to understand that. And then if it is a hazard, what can I do to make it safer? So back to some pure math at the university, you're even looking at that. So kind of in summary for you, um, our mission at the university, we don't intend to be routine operators of these airplanes. We intend to develop new technologies, to be essentially a pathfinder to new, new industry. If this makes sense, if we can find an application where this technology makes sense, Trust me, there's an industry out there that will step in, in and do the daily operations that, that Alaska Fire Service may want or the Coast Guard may want. We're out there right now trying to understand what their needs are and help them understand what their, their the capabilities are. That's really our role. Um, so our program, safe airspace integration. How do we fly with other airplanes? This is us and this is a um, Alaska Fire Service airplane. How do we fly with other airplanes and be safe about it? How do we build new payloads and new products? And then let's take this all together, roll it up periodically and go out and do an experiment. Get on a ship, try, try some of these ideas out. And that's kind of the nutshell of what we do in the whole project. And at the university, um, our value to the university is kind of in the university's perspective. I would argue that the community is getting a chance to the community being the people that may have interest in unmanned aircraft, be it industry or scientific users, may have a chance to experiment um, with our help. The research that comes out of it is making the university more competitive. We are able to um, find new opportunities to do remote sensing, um, new opportunities for engineering problems, solving engineering problems. And education, um, we've managed, because this project, this is a growing field. Again, this industry in the last 10 years grew over 1,000% growth. Yeah, 1, 000, oh, two orders of magnitude growth. There's a lot of students, especially engineering students and remote sensing students that are interested in this technology. And we've actually had, a, had have one now and have other interests coming up to the university because we have systems, because we're actually doing the operations, they get some firsthand knowledge. Any questions?
drones have uh, any uh, ice? Uh, can they uh, break ice off the wings or anything? The question was, do any of these aircraft, these, these drones, have the ability to, to break ice off the wings to survive in icing conditions? And the answer is yes. This one does not today, and that's actually a project we're doing with the manufacturer to try to understand that um, he's focused today on trying to survive in hot weather in Iraq. Um, but realistically, we're working on that problem with him. There are some small larger planes. The one that we flew in November at King Salmon, that Predator, actually had wings that were, were they could anti-ice the wings in flight. Are there any ways, any safer ways to land it without driving into a rope? Actually, I don't know where the question came from, but yes. Um, this, the company that built this plane, had built an initial plane they built, launched off of a car top. They loaded it on a, on a luggage rack of a car and drove the car up to speed and the airplane flew off the car, landed on its, on its belly on some skids on, on the ground. As they were designing this plane, um, they wanted one to be able to launch and recover on a ship, so the rope was pretty clever. When they got to looking at putting skids on it to do dirt landing, the runway landing, they decided that was only going to be used if it had an emergency and it couldn't land the other way. And it's much harder on the airplane. Um, and it can land that way. This, I can dig up a video to show you it can land that way. It's not what you want to do because it usually damages the belly of the plane. Um, that rope recovery, even though it looks hard on the airplane, the launch is much harder. Imagine going zero to 55 miles an hour in 14 feet. That's what the launch is like. The recovery is gentle compared to that. Um, and I'd say one of the most gentlest ways to get the plane out of the air is just it just holds on to it. Okay, so everybody knows that what goes up must come down. So what's the most expensive crash that you've ever had in your career? Our most expensive crash, and this one has crashed. Um, I'll confess that. It cost 150 bucks. I was really lucky. We damaged a dome on the camera. And I also took it as an opportunity to repaint the airplane. It needed a new paint job. Um, so it made me cost a little more because I repainted it. The most expensive crashes that I anticipate having? Oh, okay. In my career, I crashed. Well, okay. I built a helicopter that was shot down by a missile, and that was intentional, so I wouldn't call that a crash. We built an unmanned helicopter that had a human on board. He was flying the plane. He crashed it for me. That was by far my most expensive crash, because, but I wasn't flying it. My most expensive crash was a total loss of that, that electric-powered helicopter you saw. I did the controls for it. And the controls did not fail, but it, winches, it let it go out on a winch and pulled it back down. The winch locked on launch. And so the airplane tried to pull the barge, the barge we were launching off of and couldn't, and it went straight into the water, total loss. This one I expect, or some of the predecessors when we were doing experiments over the ocean, probably lose one. And that's actually the most damaging for the airplane. You hit the salt water. It's, it's, an, it's a relic to hang in the roof of somebody's conference room at that point. Are you manufacturing these airplanes we are, um, here in Fairbanks? Today we are not. The question was, are we manufacturing them? Today we're not. Um, one of the goals of the project back to safety was working with an airplane that had known performance, known reliability. This plane has over 200,000 hours on its design, over 1,500 shipboard launches and recoveries. Um, I'll, in my lifetime, I'll never, this university will never have that much airtime on our fleet. And so be able to, but to leverage off of that history, that lessons learned was what we chose with this manufacturer. Um, we have, and we may do that though, because there are some advantages to doing our own design as we continue to push the payload issues and the issues around the plane that's not really designed for some of these applications we're doing. Um, yeah, it's actually kind of a prophetic statement because we are considering that, but we have not yet. Um, do I understand that you're going to be using a large one of these to do the ocean bottom of the Arctic Ocean this coming year, or that's just an idea? Okay, no. Um, the ocean bottom mapping is done from the ship. Uh, that big dice breaker that gets out and maps it. We're looking to fly this plane over the top of that ship or out in front of that ship to help the ship guidance to tell the ship where, to, where it's easier for him to travel. And where is it going to be taking off from and landing? It will launch and recover on the ship deck. So again, it'll be off the icebreaker. Interesting issue with the Coast Guard, when the ships go that far north, the Coast Guard don't want to fly their helicopters off the ship because it's too dangerous. Kind of a hint, maybe this is a good place to put an unmanned airplane when they don't even want to fly their own aircraft. And so the results are the ship goes out there blind. The ship can see as far as he can see off the bridge. 
and it'd be nice if we're just trying to extend his eyeballs out over the horizon. Because this was related somewhat to what was uh, developed for the military, I'm wondering what is currently being developed by the military that may perhaps fall into your lap. Okay. Um, this plane is in flight today. There's about 8,000 hours being put on this airplane configuration today by the military. Um, the new military technology that's out there, one of the, actually one of the advantages we have with this aircraft is the work we're doing at the university. And usually, okay, I used to be an Army program manager, an Army officer managing programs and research. And if I funded a university to do research, maybe in a decade, something would come out of that research that would be useful for the military. Not so with this project, because what we fly today, they could fly in a week, because it's the same plane. The benefit of that is also there is some military surplus of these particular planes that are perhaps coming available that I'm trying to posture ourselves to be able to get a hold of. So we'll see how that works out. Did that answer your question? What do they currently have in development? Oh, in development? Um, this is operational, but it's still being improved. Development of new systems, they're building smaller systems. Um, the, they're very big focus on small planes, the hand launch, the, the trash can on the rooftop. And then they're doing a lot of development on the larger aircraft, the much bigger aircraft. And NASA is getting the benefits of some of those. NASA is getting the surplus of the Global Hawks, for example, that are coming out. What is the fuel capacity of it, and how much does it burn per hour? This one um, burn well. It's it got about two gallons, a two gallon payload of fuel. Of, sorry, two gallon fuel, fuel tank at 20 hours plus some reserve. So I'm thinking it's like I trying to recall off the top of my head, looking at the ground station. I think it's about 0.15 to 0.2. Well, it's by weight, 0.15 to 0.2 kilograms an hour. So that's 0.4 pounds. I have to convert it from weight to gallons, but, but basically two gallons for 20 hours. Easy, with reserve. Um, what temp would it be so that you can't fly these on it, unmanned aircraft anymore? That actually is a research problem we're trying to solve. The, com <laughs> the company um, is right now today worried about hot weather. How do you fly this airplane when it's 120 degrees outside and not keep it from overheating? Um, they have done operations at about zero themselves in Canada. Um, we've done ground runs below zero, but not flight ops. We actually have a goal this winter, if we can get another cold snap, maybe in February, and I get my act together, we'll, do, we'll get this thing up and do at least some ground runs and some checks. We're, we did not, we're not expecting to see any problems until about 30 or 40 below zero, but that's actually something we want to do some experiments on. And it'll be ground-based experiments initially, because anything that's gonna fail that we can detect is gonna not be an issue with the air. Okay? Yeah. But that's a problem, though. That they would like to understand. The military would like to understand that. Today, they're not fighting cold weather battles, but that doesn't mean that won't be the case in the future. Yes? Uh, how about security of the aircraft? Somebody like me know all your secret codes. You want to? Um, I take over the control seal. You ever, <laughs> you ever had that happen? No, I haven't. Actually, the, the military hasn't had that happen. Um, the airplane does broadcast in the clear, but the message traffic is encrypted. So if you, if you, you, more likely what you could do if you try to take control of that airplane, and that airplane all of a sudden had two ground stations talking to it, what it will do, it will shut up and listen to neither of them and go assume it has lost communications and it has a pre-programmed -pre flight plan it'll do. Um, actually, one way the military operate this plane today, they'll do what they call a hub and spoke. They'll launch out of one site because it has such long legs. They'll launch out of one site, do all the maintenance, get them in the air. They'll put out 20 or 30 planes a day. They fly them out 20 or 30 miles. They turn off their radio. The other end of it has somebody in the back of a home V that has just the ground station. He turns on his radio. He picks the plane up and flies his mission all day long, sends it back home at night, and somebody back home takes care of it. And so, but you can have multiple ground stations talking, but if you don't turn one off before the other turns on, the plane assumes it's being jammed and goes into a lost communications modes. In our case, what Lost Communications does is we orbit a defined point for a very long time, a few hours, to make sure we can reestablish communications. If we can't, that gives me a chance on the ground station to fix the problem if it was on the ground. If it doesn't establish that communications, it will come in and do a, one of those belly landings that we described that I don't like to do if we didn't have to. It'll land on a road or a clear spot. Did you say you had one that was five inches across? I built one that had six inch wingspan. 
for special forces when I was in, uh, in business. Totally different design. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Different product when you try to build, make your circuit boards be winged surfaces as well. What's your time span for an LOA from the FAA? In other words, uh, inspiration, uh, let's do this to actually get an airborne. How long does the bureaucracy take to oh, okay. uh, get that approved? Depends on where it's at and what kind of mission it is. Um, if it's in airspace that the FAA are not responsible for, like if it's at, on restricted airspace on the range, it would be a, a day to get out there. The FAA, if I'm going somewhere for routine operations, if I want to go operate in Beaver, Alaska and, and do moose surveys, for example, it could take me at least two months and realistically probably three to four months to get permission from the FAA. At the same time that happens, they've agreed and if we almost exercised it last year. They have exercised it at NASA for what they call an emergency situation where they would guarantee that if, we, if, if someone in authority, say the fire service calls us, or the natural, natural disaster, a volcano erupts and they want to fly into it, they've agreed to give us permission within 24 hours. And they've demonstrated that on some wildfires in California last year in um, 90 minutes. So it, it, the, the 60 day process can be curtailed very quickly, assuming everything is, is kind of pre-planned. And right now we are in, in that state of status with the FAA. We have a pre-planned permission with them waiting for an emergency response call. And then in that case, we're talking about a day or two. Greg, I'm uh, impressed with uh, <clears throat> the presentation. Um, you've shown us uh, where you've covered the ice, mapping the uh, undersides, underside of the water, the ocean, and so forth. Do you, are you doing anything with volcanoes? Are you flying through them uh, and so forth? No, we're not. There's a couple people here from the Volcano Observatory in Fairbanks, the Alaska Volcano Observatory, and we had discussions about doing that type of work. Um, there's discussions about doing routine operations to see how volcanoes before they blow. There's been discussions about flying in ash plumes. There's been no serious where, when, get ready for it. Next time it happens, I want you to go discussions yet. Not that we couldn't, we just haven't got that far. About how much does this plane weigh? This plane, if it was full of fuel and had the camera on, would be up to about 40 pounds. Have you ever had a, one of the rope recovery um, miss? Yes, but not any damage. What happens if, if, the, if there's too much turbulence in the wind, if the airplane can't line itself up to hit the rope on the wing and come down the wing and snag on the cook, if it misses the rope, it'll wave off and go around and set itself back up again, and then we try again. Um, in fact, we even practiced that when we were on the ship. There was concerns aboard the ship that they didn't want me to land if they couldn't see it. They wanted to make sure they knew where it was coming and it wasn't going to fly into the ship. And so we practice when there's good visibility what it looks like coming in so they can understand how far out we have to see the plane. And so in that case, we took the rope off and flew past where the rope would have been and it just missed the rope and it would do its own thing. How far can they fly before they run out of fuel? Okay. This plane does not have a satellite communication system in it. So if I wanted to, to not talk to it when I flew it, I could fly 20 hours at 60 miles an hour. So it's at um, 2,000 miles, um, maybe further. If, and there are versions of this plane that actually do have communications on board. Give you an example of one thing they've done with that. They were able to launch and recover this aircraft in Oregon from a ship in the Persian Gulf. So halfway around the world, they were able to fly the plane. Now, they didn't fly it halfway around the world, but they were able to control it that far. So it's just a matter of how much fuel you carry and how far you want to go. Can you manually take over the flight controls? You can. I could not. Um, I do fly radio control planes a little bit. If anybody's familiar with aerodynamics, this plane is, it looks fairly unstable. Um, no tail, you know, just a flying wing. Um, it's, it would require some very skilled piloting to keep it control if I took it radio control. I technically could, never have, never intend to. It'll crash. <laughs> I'd rather let the autopilot do it. Wouldn't at high speeds, wouldn't that thing, when it hits the string on the wing, couldn't it damage, do damage? It can, but usually it's less damage than it would if it hits the ground. Um, we have damaged the wings in the past on recovery. More likely, what happens on recovery that would do damage is if I get the rope tangled around the winglet, it could tear the winglet off. That's a common, not a common, but a, but a frequent problem. You're talking about flying in volcano plumes. 
And I'm wondering if you'd be able to shut down the engine in bad air and glide for a while and have a restart capability. I don't have airborne restart. I wish I did. Or, yeah, I mean, would that be an, a thing worth pursuing? Some. Um, I don't know. I almost would just assume I may lose the engine in the in the ash, but the engine's cheap. Can you control throttle on it? Could you throttle back? Oh yes, yes. Okay. Oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah, and the autopilot can do that as well. At the beginning of the movie, they showed a, a drone that going through a tunnel. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if, uh, how is communication in there? How does it, uh, okay. is it picking up satellite or something? No, or how, no. how does it steer through the tunnel? That guy, that was the Academy Award winner for flying, a, basically flying a movie camera. And he's a very skilled pilot, radio control pilot, who goes along behind it all the time. So he's always in line of sight. You don't see him in the pictures, but he's there. Um, I wasn't so much implying that was the technology we're working after because that's that's really more of an art form for that pilot, but it, but I was trying to show the technology what the technology could do. The airplane is capable of doing that sort of work, so that's what I was trying to show with that one. But yeah, he's he's behind in a truck, even when he's in a building. I've seen him fly it on video. Um, that that's a segment of a long video from him. The guy I used to work with, and he's flown it over in football stadiums, and he'll he'll be on the back of a pickup truck flying, or the plane's doing its own thing. Well, thank you very much, and thank you.